We go forth into the reign of uh, Emperor Vespasian. Uh, the, this is circa 75 AD, and in the year 70, he and his son Titus uh, conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. The, uh, he was emperor between 69 and 79 AD. It was, uh, he came from the family of the Flavians, and was during uh, the Flavians that these uh, extreme hairdos for the women became uh, very fashionable, as you see here. And uh, you can compare, this is the hairdo for Livia, who was the wife of Augustus, and that is approximately the year zero. And then 70 years later, we have this. To do something like this, one needed a so-called ornatrix a servant, a slave, who specialized in uh, doing this sort of hair. Uh, this is what it may have looked like. It, I'm sure it was quite, quite extraordinary. It was under the station that the Colosseum will be built. Uh, and the Colosseum is uh, an amphitheater. Amphi means double. So what happened was that uh, the architects took two theaters and put them together, and thus it became a double theater. It became a Yankee Stadium. It is a double theater, it's an amphitheater. So whenever we see uh, a half circle of, uh, uh, of theatrical construction, that's a theater. A double one is an amphitheater. And here we have it. Uh, they need, the Romans needed it for their gladiatorial games, for their games of the between the beasts and the gladiators, between the beasts it, uh, themselves, and uh, according to one account, it could in fact be even flooded, and, uh, and naval games uh, between gladiators could in fact be enacted there, as you see here. This is where cement really comes into play. The Roman cement technique, also called concrete, it's a material used in construction in ancient Rome. Concrete was based on hydraulic setting cement. In other words, it solidified underwater, which was phenomenal for, for the aqueducts, for instance, where water was there at all times. It is durable due to its incorporation of porcelanic ash, which prevents cracks from spreading. And by the middle of the first century, the material was used frequently, 1st century AD. Often brick-faced, although variations in aggregate allow different arrangements of materials. So in other words, cement would be inside, and then on the outside, either brick or some other stone would be used to face. And there are different names, opus insertum, opus reticulatum, Opus uh, Testaceum, various types of facing, and then later on marble, of course, could also be used. This is what Colosseum looks today, and the reason for its uh, unfortunate uh, state is not even so much um, earthquakes, which or time, which of course both took its share, but the fact that in Renaissance Rome, Colosseum and most of the forum were used as um, stone quarries, so the marble that faced the Colosseum was all stripped off, and the Colosseum was left in this unfortunate state, as you see. Uh, this is a view from above, and this is what it looks like today. It's completely exposed, because as I said, uh, either marble or limestone that faced the seats, that faced the interior, were all stripped. Uh, the, um, this is kind of an imagining of uh, how the beasts were delivered to the arena. Arena in Latin means sand, as I think it is in Spanish. And that's where we get the word arena, because it was covered with sand. So the beasts uh, would be let out and, uh, of their cages into elevators, and then uh, either here or there and then brought in elevators to the uh, ground floor and let out. So you may look at this when you, uh, uh, when you get your PowerPoints. This is a great painting by a 19th century painter called uh, Jean-Léon Jérôme, 
and it's called Polis Verso, in other words, thumb down. And it shows the Roman priestesses, the Roman uh, Vestal Virgins, who are turning their thumb down, encouraging this gladiator to kill his opponent. Um, brilliant painting, very much conveys what it may have looked like in the middle, uh, in the middle loggia, see, uh, sits the emperor himself. Uh, here is a cross section of how Colosseum was constructed, right here, and the uh, here's another one, and the seats were based. Now the entire uh, structure represented a hill. Whereas in Greece, theaters were built on a hill, here a hill had to be, in fact, constructed, and was constructed with the help of cement. So what you see essentially is the emulation of a hill. And then the Colosseum, just as our modern stadiums are, was divided into numbered uh, walkways, and people had their tickets that directed them to their seats. The only difference in the Colosseum was that uh, the seating was arranged according to social status. In, at the bottom sat the senators, then the knights, then the plebeians. Now, they also included their women, uh, and, but, but the single women or the poor women, the slaves, they all went up. They all sat all the way up, and I assure you those steps are extremely steep. One needs very strong legs to, to, climb, um, to climb up there. This is another representation of what it may have looked like. Then up there, as you see those poles, those were used to, uh, to cast the so-called velarium, to cast the uh, canvas above the seats to keep them from the sun. Here is another idea what how it may have been done. And these are the poles. They were operated, in fact, by the Roman sailors, because Roman sailors, of course, were familiar with lifting and lowering of canvas on their ships. And therefore, they did the same for the Colosseum. Here's another example of the same, so that the, uh, the visitors were protected from the sun. Here again is another reconstruction. And what is very significant about the Colosseum is that in, it is one of the first times when architectural orders are in fact superimposed uh, on one another. The, the entire first story and has the door recorder, which the Romans called the Tuscan order because the Romans inherited all that artistic achievement of the East and then could mix and match whatever they wanted. Uh, so the door, they took the Doric order and for the most part eliminated uh, the flutes, the, uh, the grooves uh, made the shaft smooth, called it the Tuscan order. And as a result, so the first uh, story is decorated, they're, all, they're also half columns, decorated with the Doric order. Then the second story here is decorated with the Ionic order, and then the third is the Corinthian order. And on the uh, last story, we see Corinthian pilasters. A pilaster is the same as a half column, but square. And here we have these Corinthian pilasters. In all the arches, and arches are everywhere in Rome, uh, there were sculptures, sculptures of great men of Rome, sculptures, mythological sculptures, gods, uh, heroes, all of it was represented. That was built by Vespasian. After Vespasian, the next emperor was his son Titus. After he died, his brother Domitian, the following emperor, built the so-called Arch of Titus. And that arch was essentially dedicated to the capture of Jerusalem. And as such, we see on inside the arch, there are two very important reliefs. They still exist, and uh, here they are. And one of the reliefs shows Emperor in uh, triumph. Whenever a Roman general is very successful fighting against the enemy, he was given a so-called 
triumph by the Roman Senate. In other words, he could enter Rome driving a stunning chariot uh, with uh, four white horses and bring all his loot, bring the slaves, bring all his accomplishments essentially to show the Romans his great accomplishments overseas. And that's what we see here. Here's Titus with his uh, four-horse chariot and uh, the chariot is being led by victory and another victory is crowning him with the garland of victory right here. And this is what it is right there. And uh, on the other side are the spoils of the Temple of Jerusalem. And there is a great seven candle menorah that was taken from the, uh, from the temple as well as so much other treasure. And uh, it is possible that it is that treasure, in fact, that paid for the uh, Colosseum because, of course, that cost much to build. My favorite, Balash Balo, whose illustrations you had seen before, and here is his attempt at the procession of the treasures. And uh, here are, here they are carrying the laws of Judea, the scrolls of Judea. And what you can see here better perhaps than on the original is that the sculptor in fact created uh, a convex line heading the uh, further figures come out frontally towards us then turn slightly, go along the way, and then disappear into the arch that is at an angle to our surface. Uh, and here you have all the, uh, uh, all the treasure that had been taken from, uh, uh, from the temple. Um, again, Balash Balo, another representation of what it may have looked like. Everything was, of course, colored. And we now arrive at um, the Roman forums. Now something that we need to remember is that a Roman forum essentially is uh, a shopping center. It's a marketplace. That's how it originated. In the very beginning of Rome, a forum was a place where people met to exchange goods. And then with time, because it was a hub, that's where civic buildings were built as well, because that's where everybody came. And thus, Roman Forum came into existence. Now, the very original Roman Forum. I know this is very confusing. So just think, say, of um, Mercer Mall, or Quaker Bridge Mall, or the Nassau Park, or Princeton Shopping Center. Think of those areas, or a large accumulation of strip malls together. Think of those and how they're all located really very near one another. That, those were the type of, the type of meeting places uh, that, where people came. The Princeton Shopping Center, it's an open space with colonnaded uh, arcade around and then shops all around and, uh, and then where a Roman temple would be. The Princeton Shopping Center, for instance, uh, has a McCoffrey grocery store, which is our uh, contemporary temple, the temple of food. So when you look at this picture, or this picture, which is the same thing, but uh, with real buildings, what you essentially see is a number of these shopping centers. Here, for instance, is the original Roman marketplace, with all the buildings around. Then, as it is felt today, when a number of people come into the area, more and more and more people, and as you can imagine, as Rome grew, it became the city of, uh, of very, very extensive population. So they needed more forums, they needed more shopping centers. And thus, the original forum was just not enough anymore. Julius Caesar built another one, right here. And here, the original forum is here, in the corner. Then Julius Caesar built this one. Then Augustus built his. Then Vespasian, at whom we looked, built his. And there's a little one of still another emperor. And the biggest, the biggest one of all, is going to be this forum of Trajan. 
still another emperor, an emperor of the beginning of the second century AD. And here you see it. It's a very, very large gathering place. This is what the Roman Forum looks today. This is what the same space looked at the time of Rome, or approximately what it looked at the time of Rome. This is what we see today, that building right here. Well, this building wasn't there, but this building was. And uh, as you see, an open space, colonnades around. Inside the colonnades, there are either shops or there are offices. Uh, offices, most, uh, most often the law offices of law. Courts, uh, civil administration, all of it is there. The archives and, of course, the temples. The temples are everywhere. And in the middle, there would be uh, an equestrian statue. That largest one, the, this one that we're looking at, is this, right here. And now we're going to look at the largest one, the Forum of Trajan, right here. It is under Trajan that geographically, that geographically Rome reached its largest extent. The map I showed you in the very beginning, that that extent Rome reached under Trajan. And as such, Trajan wished to build the largest forum, all in marble. And this is one of the recreations of such a forum. The Romans used a basilica. Now, we use a basilica for a religious building, but it was originally a Roman building and it was a civic building. Very often, basilicas housed Roman courts. They housed uh, Roman law courts, law offices, jurisprudence was housed in the basilicas. At other times, a basilica would be a Quaker Bridge Mall. It would be a shopping center. Also could be the case. What you see here is a basilica that is built perpendicular to the court, and then the temple is behind it. Here. This is the court itself. This is the basilica. It's called Basilica Ulpia, because that was the last name of Trajan's family. Then uh, there would be a small court with a very important column and two libraries on each side. This is the basilica and as you see a basilica would have two apses and in most cases entrance into the basilica would be from the sides. When the Christians took over and used this type of a building for their churches they would then cut off one of the ends, the western end usually, make that an entrance and make the eastern end as an apse. Here we have it, this is one of the apses and in the case of Rome again there would be figures of the heroes, of their emperors and there would be a very large figure of an emperor in one of the apses. Here we go through the basilica into the court with that column that I mentioned, and two libraries. One library was uh, a library of Greek literature, the other library was the library of Roman literature, and that's what they may have looked like. What we are looking at here are shelves with scrolls, because at that time codexes or books, as we know them, were rare, and the majority of uh, literature, philosophy, anything and everything was written on scrolls, and these are the scrolls. Here, perhaps, is another view with the reading tables, as we would have today in the library, and uh, this is um, a bronze figure of Trajan, which looks very much like uh, a marble figure of Augustus. And you can imagine that once uh, a convention was established, then it was so easy to follow that convention, especially when it was so successful. Again, our Basilica Ulpia, this is the column we're going to, and here it is. It survives. The column is still there. It is a very unique construction. Uh, nothing like this had ever been done before. Not in Egypt, not in Greece, not in Mesopotamia. 
It originally stood between two buildings, the uh, libraries. To the left stood the north entrance to the forum. Right behind the column was one of the two libraries. And to the right, a wall of uh, the basilica, right here. Uh, let me show you. This is what it looks like today. The column is still there. The building is gone. And uh, you can still see it. It um, Trajan's column. Here's the section so you can see that the steps went up again for the purpose of repairs. It was all colored and it represented Trajan's conquests in uh, today's Romania. That's he, he in fact uh, crossed the Danube and went into those lands, conquered those lands and everything is represented on a scroll going up the column, as you see here. It is very unique. The idea may have come from the fact that it did, in, it did sit between the two libraries, and the libraries were full of scrolls, and uh, whoever the brilliant uh, architect was, sculptor, he felt that this could also be related in a scroll. I mean, it's the same idea as the Parthenon frieze or as the imperial procession frieze on the Arapaches, except, of course, it gives you the possibility of doing so much more. It's like a roll of film. But, of course, the farther up you look, the less visible it becomes, which is why color was uh, very helpful. Also, because it was between the libraries and there was a balcony all around, one could go up on the balcony and, uh, and in fact see much better. Also people didn't live as long as we live today plus their eyesight was better and younger. Here, as I said, the uh, Roman army did not fight all the time. The Roman army probably fought 10% of the time. The rest of the time they built they went into new territories that they had conquered, they built roads, they built fortifications, they built castles, they built the aqueducts, they built baths, they were engineers, they were everything. They were jacks of all trade, in addition to being soldiers. And as a result, we see all these activities portrayed on the uh, Trajan column. Here, this is a representation, an allegory of uh, the Danube River, right here, as he is looking benevolently at the activities of the Romans. Here, they cross the river on the pontoon bridge, built of, their, of the boats. Right here, they are building walls, uh, constructing something. Uh, then later, more of the same planting trees. Here is Trajan is everywhere. Trajan participates a hundred percent with his soldiers. He eats the same food as uh, eaten by his soldiers. He lives the same way as his sol soldiers live. I mean he was originally a soldier and came up through the ranks. The soldiers truly love him and admire him and you see him everywhere. Either he is addressing the troops or he is helping with advice, or he is planning the next campaign. He is all around uh, the column. And you also see the fights. And in the fights here, there is the cool composure of the Roman, right here, versus the emotionalism of the barbarian. And here we are back to, to the Athenian Parthenon and its metopes where the Greeks uh, would be uh, would be portrayed as uh, self-controlled, whereas uh, whereas the barbarians would be portrayed as emotionals. Uh, whether whether the barbarians are the Amazons or whether they are the centaurs or it's uh, giants uh, against the gods, uh, whatever stands for reason is always composed. Whatever stands for enthusiasm always is shown emotional. And uh, from here, we then proceed to another remarkable structure that survived from the Roman times. And this structure is the Pantheon, as opposed to the Parthenon. The Parthenon we looked at 
was dedicated to Athena Parthenos, and that's why it is the Parthenon. In this case, this temple was dedicated to all the Roman gods, which is why it's called Pan, everywhere, everybody, Theon, which is gods, as you remember our Pan American Airlines, the airline, the airlines of all of the America, and uh, and here is the temple of all gods. Now, this particular temple was built in the early uh, second century AD, but there were other temples preceding it, not least a temple that was built by Marcus Agrippa, who was Augustus's general. And chances are that temple looked like uh, Maison Carré or the, uh, the little temple of Portinus that we had looked at in the beginning of the lecture. However, all those temples were destroyed, burnt, what have you. And the Emperor Hadrian, who, uh, who saw himself as, uh, as an architect and was, and was uh, participated in the design of this structure and the design uh, became a blueprint for so many structures of the future. Between the Parthenon and Pantheon, uh, <laughs> you look around at uh, neoclassical architecture even in America and you'll be recognizing it throughout. The um, porch is still as we're used to, a classical rectilinear Greek porch. And in the front it says Marcus Agrippa made me because Hadrian did not wish his name exhibited and had great respect for the time of Augustus and for Marcus Agrippa, so he uh, repeated the, uh, the saying. But then behind it, there is absolutely nothing conventional, because behind it is this enormous rotunda. Now, the Greeks used rotundas, but only very small ones, and usually for funerary temples. To build a rotunda on this kind of scale was, uh, was very remarkable. Here is what it originally looked like. It had sort of a form in front of it. I mean, these, uh, uh, these colonnades, these arcades, will later in times medieval turn into cloisters. But temples often had them. One walked into an arcade, that'd be a triumphal arch, and then here's the temple. The, uh, we don't see the uh, uh, steps today because the ground has risen, as you can see here. The ground has risen very considerably, so the steps disappeared. But there were steps originally. You go through the portico and into the rotunda itself. Now, the, this kind of dome would be extremely heavy would be impossible to build, really, in masonry, which is why the Romans used cement. And, what, and cement can be manipulated, because uh, you can add very strong stone to cement, something like uh, diorite, or even stronger, and to make cement very, very strong. Or you can add uh, something like tufa, uh, which is a very light stone, and make it lighter, and various types of limestone in between. And uh, so the oculus, then there's an oculus, they, they cut this um, open, open space, and it is open, there is no glass there. So either rain or snow come through it, but there's a, there's a system, the hydraulic system, under the floor that takes care of moisture. It is 26, 27 feet wide, the oculus itself, and then the dome itself, it's very cleverly constructed because at its base, right here, it is 23 feet thick so that it could hold the weight of the dome. But only two feet right there at the oculus. As you see, it's diminishing as it goes up, and that was possible because of cement. Then, of course, having cut this enormous hole in the dome also lightened it. And another feature that lightened the dome were the coffers these uh, waffle, waffle looking uh, uh, designs. It's called the coffered ceiling, right here. 
and the lower portion of the dome is stepped, sort of like uh, the um, temple of Bazolus in Halicarnassus that we had seen in our Hellenistic lecture. Uh, the way it is constructed is a, as a perfect sphere, as a perfect universe, as the Romans saw it. It is, you can inscribe a circle in it. It is very difficult to catch it, even with the modern camera. This is one of the best representations. The marbles, many of the marbles are still original, which, is, which in itself is, of course, wonderful. The dome was probably colored blue, and inside each coffer there'd be a bronze rosette. One of the best representations is that of Giovanni Paolo Panini, who was a painter in Rome in the 18th century, and at that time many, many foreigners came to Rome and the trade in, um, in these sort of paintings was, uh, was very brisk because, well, they didn't have postcards at the time. So painters did views of Rome. And, and of course, a painter can manipulate what he sees as uh, photography still cannot do as well as a painter. So here he uh, catches the entire interior. And what the Romans now begin to do, with the help of cement, they begin to shape space as the Greeks never did. With the Greeks, it was four walls and post and lintel. So they defined space. The Romans begin to shape space as a sculpture with the positive and the, uh, the negative elements. And such are those niches or the, uh, uh, or the niches that are cut around the... Uh, here, the main, the main circle, as you see here. All of this is shaping space, as the Greeks never did. And, uh, and that is what you see here. Also, walking in, it, it truly is an unforgettable experience, because one does feel as if one is inside a universe. And you can imagine that when that ceiling was originally blue, with the little gilded rosettes, you did look up at... Um, at the universe. This is what it looks like today in the uh, middle of Rome. Uh, there is no longer the colonnetted space in front of it. Uh, this is a baroque obelisk. And here is still a rather extraordinary image as you can see it here and this is what it looks from uh, on high. It sort of looks like a space station. And now, thus we go to the city of Pompeii. And the reason we go there, even though it's a provincial city, was, is because, remarkably, this is the one provincial city that was preserved for us. Preserved, uh, its, its houses were preserved, its paintings were preserved, much of, uh, even utensils were preserved, the way of life was preserved. And the reason for that was because in the year 79, A.D., Mount Vesuvius that you see in the back, erupted. And as it erupted, it covered the entire area in ash that later solidified and thus preserved the entire city underneath. This is what the city of Pompeii must have looked like before it was destroyed in 79. This is what it looks like today. Interestingly, because Romans went all over the Mediterranean and, of course, brought their methods of building and, uh, and their conventions with them. They, of course, went to Spain as well. But then the Spaniards in uh, the 16th century, they went to South America. And with them, they brought the same methods of construction and the same types of construction. So today, in a city which is Antigua in Guatemala. Here's Guatemala in Mesoamerica. One goes to Antigua, which is an old capital, and particularly in the center of the city, what one sees is this um, rectilinear plan that was originally Greek, but then the Romans inherited it, and they used it for their military camps, but then also for their new towns. And it's all, again, rectilinear. In the middle is a square, with the church, and you can see how it's arranged here. Now, this is, at, this is today, 
This is the city of Antigua. Right here, it exists. It is, uh, it, it's a very delightful city, very interesting city. And behind it is a volcano, Pacaya volcano, that doesn't function as, uh, that doesn't erupt as Vesuvius erupted. And this is this city of Pompeii. So when you go to something like Antigua, you, you literally you walk around the city of Pompeii before it was, um, it was destroyed. Um, a brilliant uh, <laughs> painting by a Russian, a Russian painter, Karl Brilov, uh, back in the 19th century. And it's called The Last Day of Pompeii. It is not accurate because lava never came to Pompeii. However, it's extremely dramatic, romantic, and was, uh, was met with great acclaim when it was uh, first painted. It was a city as any other with, of course, its marketplace, with, of course, its forum. And here you have the forum with the temple with its regular streets, people going up and down, doing their business, uh, with shops in the corners that sold fast food. Uh, and Pompeii shows us as no other city, well, perhaps it's because it survived in such a relatively good state, the development of a Roman house. And uh, it developed from an original footprint right here. This was just a typical Roman domus, a structure that was built around a small courtyard with a little kitchen garden in the back. So here you have it. Here's a little open courtyard and then the bedrooms, whatever rooms were needed, the dining rooms. Uh, these uh, outer rooms could either be used by the family or they could be rented as shops. And then a kitchen garden in the back. But then, um, as Rome went a conquering, they met these glorious structures in Greece and in other lands. And as such, they began to add to their original house. So these are Greek, the so-called Greek additions. The columns around, the peristyle. And then from here, it can just go anywhere, pretty much. And uh, it, the, the, the wealthier you are, the uh, the more additions you can make to a house. It's not uh, very different from today. And in the houses there developed what was classified in the 19th century as four styles of decoration. And the first style imitated interesting stone, such as marble or malachite, which would be very expensive to import, but one can just imitate it in paint. And here you have it. Now the second style and that developed between in the in the first century BC. The second st style is illusionary style. It's painting the wall as if there is no wall, as there is a vista there, whether architectural vista or a landscape. That was the second style. The third style became more ornamental. It became more attenuated as we will see, and then the fourth will be just the combination of all the styles. So you see here the first Pompeian style, imitations of uh, various, uh, uh, vari whether it's various marbles, the white marble, the blue marble, the pink marble, or as I said, malachite, or uh, lapis lazuli, anything and everything. That's the first Pompeian style. Second Pompeian style, in this case, a garden is imitated, illusionistic garden. It's almost as if one can step over this haha wall and go and pluck some of the fruit. This also is the second Pompeian style. In this case, architecture is depicted, and in this case, an actual battle in the Colosseum. And then a very interesting second Pompeian style we find in a villa that is outside of Pompeii. It's about a mile away. And it's called Villa of Mysteries. This is what this villa looked like. And of course, it, there's a patio here overlooking the beautiful bay. Um, it is today in ruins. But in that villa, the reason it's called Villa of Mysteries is because uh, there is this room that portrays some, some sort of a religious uh, ceremony, which probably was uh, a Dionysus uh, ceremony of sorts. We don't really know exactly what goes on, 
but the figures all act out their part on a shallow stage. And this too is very much the second Pompeian style. There is an initiation of a young woman as she goes through various steps, encounters, trials, and then is initiated into the cult. Very much a second Pompeian style. And then the third, as I said, sort of um, very ornamental, uh, very attenuated, uh, very elegant. Uh, suddenly architecture becomes impossibly thin, of course impossible to be built in real life, where something like this is quite realistic, but uh, not in this case. And then the illusionistic part becomes tiny, tiny, becomes a miniature. And this is what you see here. If you only saw that image, you would think it's a second Pompeian style, but it isn't. So the, uh, these illusionistic images now become sort of like um, panel painting, like easel painting. It's as if there's an easel painting hung on the wall uh, in the third Pompeian style. Now, Romans loved color, as you see. So their houses were very richly decorated with color. And then the fourth Pompeian style, everything is combined. And, um, and thus, the four Pompeian styles, we now go to sculpture. We don't have much left. I mean, we have a lot of Roman copies of Greek sculpture, but not much bronze. This is one of the very rare examples when we do have a bronze equestrian statue. It is of Marcus Aurelius. The only reason it survived was because the Christians, who obviously considered all Roman emperors pagans, and melted down those um, equestrian statues, of which there were very, very, very many. But they thought this one was of Emperor Constantine. And Emperor Constantine was the first Christian emperor. As such, the Christians deified him, and uh, he became a saint, and thinking that that is him, he was preserved. Otherwise, all bronze monuments were melted down for bronze because uh, just the scrap metal is so expensive and can be used in so many cases, whether it's weaponry or coins or later on cannon, of course, and cannonballs. So all of that was destroyed. But we do have him, uh, Marcus Aurelius. For the longest time, he sat on top of the Capitoline Hill, but then I think about 20, 30 years ago, he was taken away, uh, he was replaced with a copy, and uh, he was restored and given uh, another fish pond of uh, his own. And uh, he lives also, he's, he lives right next to, to, his, um, to his copy, but inside the building. What we have here is uh, a very naturalistic uh, uh, sculpture of... Uh, of a philosopher emperor, and Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic philosopher. And as such, he is not wearing his cuirass, his military cuirass. He is not wearing his armor. He is wearing a civilian toga. And uh, he, uh, he controls the horse simply by his will, rather than by spears. He doesn't have any spears. Uh, he, uh, his hand again is extended and it's possible that underneath the horse's hoof, the front right hoof, lay a defeated barbarian. So the horse would in fact have four points of um, stability instead of three. Three is still good but four are better. But as the hoof would press upon the fallen warrior, it would have four points of pressure. And uh, with his gesture, Marcus Aurelius uh, perhaps just exhibits his uh, mercy and forgives him. The horse to the rider is still done in uh, the Fidian, uh, Fidius, the uh, sculptor of the Parthenon back in the 5th century BC. The scale is still is still a Fijian scale, a smaller horse to a larger rider, rider and you can see it with the uh, Marcus Aurelius's feet extending much below the, uh, the horse's belly, which 
on a large war horse. This would not be happening. The horse would be much larger, but the convention lived on. And as long as the horse was brilliantly depicted, uh, no one really noticed. Here he is. And it was all uh, gilded, and that's with the remnants of, of gilding you see here. And then last but not least, uh, we come to, uh, to the consideration of Roman bathing, which was an extremely important part of Roman life. Uh, Romans would usually uh, dispense with their business in the morning and then spend an afternoon in the baths because as you see here, as the baths developed, they became um, social clubs, they became uh, country clubs. Uh, they were not just bathhouses. They also had exercise rooms and they had meeting rooms and conference rooms and they had restaurants. Sometimes they had theaters, they'd have a temple. Uh, it was a social hub, uh, the greatest social hub that Romans ever, uh, ever came up with. This is, um, this is a model of a typical Roman uh, bathhouse. And uh, it would usually consist, the bath itself would usually consist of a cold water pool, frigidarium, a warm water pool, tepidarium, and a hot water bath which is Caldarium. Very many also had a pool. Here are palaestra and, and another palaestra, and those were exercise rooms. Then, of course, changing rooms, and as I said, and all around, there would be a lot of other facilities. What you see here is tepidarium. This is frigidarium right here. In between tepidarium, and this caldarium is, uh, is sort of a sauna, a hot sauna. And then here are the two palaestras. They were really just spectacular buildings. Today, well, of course they're not preserved, but uh, here are the baths of Caracalla on the outside of Rome, and they're used for concerts, the, uh, the ruins. This is what the ruins look like. This is a restored view of what the pool may have looked like because Roman baths, as I said, were remarkably beautiful. Uh, and they, they took their, these places very seriously. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the original Penn Station in New York was modeled on the baths of, uh, of Caracalla and that was stunning inside. And then, of course, then the taste for modern art uh, just deprived everyone of reason and the uh, building was demolished and what we have today was built. This is what the uh, Penn Station looked like. Thank God the Grand Central was preserved, but even Grand Central pale in comparison to what Penn Station was like. But it also gives you an idea of what the Baths of Caracalla could be like. Um, here is the reconstruction of the Hadrian. Hadrian is the emperor who built the Pantheon and his baths in uh, a provincial town of Leptis Magna, all done in these spectacular polychrome marbles. Well, we thus come to, uh, to the end of, um, of our uh, Roman art, but not quite because uh, we will still look at the Emperor Constantine, uh, whom I had mentioned, because he was the first Christian emperor. He will be the emperor who will, in fact, move the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople on the same meridian, but east. And um, the art will change under him, and he will also be the first emperor to encourage building Christian churches. He not only legalized Christianity, but then he will help Christianity to acquire its feet. So that part of um, the uh, Roman art, in other words, the late empire, as it is called, we will look at when we start with the Christian art. Thank you very much, and um, I'll see you next week.